Hey guys, this is Rene. Welcome back for another programming tutorial on this channel. And today we will have a look at a candlestick pattern. And I decided to take this video of the Trading Geek as a inspiration. And we will write a automated trading strategy, a expert advisor for this specific um, three line strike pattern. That's the name that he chose. And we will automate it so you can test this over multiple years on historical data and we do all of this together. So, so this will be step by step uh, from the total beginning. So if you have no programming knowledge at all, you can still follow along. So do not miss this chance and watch the whole video to really understand how such a program is built from the beginning so you can use it for your own testing. And if you ever, ever wondered if these chart patterns that trading gurus like the trading geek that they recommend and that they explain if these actually work. If you always wondered if there is something to it, then definitely make sure to watch this video. So what we have here is essentially we just have three smaller candles that go like into one direction and then one big candle that goes into the other direction. Of course, um, like the trading geek says, you should also have some analysis of the overall trend before you trade this pattern. So for example, this, um, yeah, I mean, he kind of indicated the entry and the stop loss wrong. This would be, wait, no, I don't know what he's doing. Like here he's saying this is a bullish pattern, but later on he explains in his example that it is a... Um, a bearish pattern so I don't know what's going on here in this video but um, yeah what he says is essentially if you have a downtrend and then if you have like these three um, smaller green candles and then one big red candle you want to entry at the low of this red candle and then you just want to um, place the stop loss of at the high of this red candle so this is exactly what we will do now in the programming part of this video. So what we want to do is like, for example, let's have a look at one example in the actual chart. You do see these patterns from time to time. So it's not like completely unre unrealistic. Like for example, here we have these three green candles um, followed by this um, extremely big red candle. So this would be a signal that the trading geek would probably trade and that's what we want our automated trading program to trade. So um, let's jump right into the programming. So whenever you want to start writing a program in the MetaTrader 5, the easiest way is to go to tools and then Meta calls language editor in your MetaTrader 5. This will automatically open the Meta um, editor and let me delete some of these files. We do not need these. And um, yeah, it, look, it should look somehow like this. And on the left side, you can find the navigator. And if you do not find it, you can um, open it by clicking view navigator. And here are all the programs that you currently have and that you can edit. We want to create a new program. So in the upper left corner, we click on new and we click on next. And then we choose a name for program. Let's just go with like, what is he saying? Three line strike. So we say, three line strike pattern and then click on next, next and finish. And this will create a brand new expert advisor for you. So new expert advisors usually look like this. They have um, three event handling functions, the on in it, the on D in it and the on tick. These are like the most basic functions that you usually have and use in most expert advisors. Then we have a lot of these gray lines. Gray lines are just comments. Let me delete them for now because we don't need these like most basic comments. Or maybe, yeah, let's, let's keep the expert initialization function like the explanation for these uh, functions because a lot of you guys recommended in the comments of the YouTube videos that I should um, use more comments in my code. So I will try to do this. And then personally, I like to rearrange these um, um, curly brackets. As you can see, like we usually have like for the function, we have a opening curly bracket and a closing curly brackets. And whenever you see these curly brackets, they usually wrap the body of something. In this specific case is the body of the on init function. Here it is the body of the on init function. Here it is the body of the on tick function. And um, what the body of a function means is it's pretty much whatever, uh, like, inside the body of a function, you put the code 
that should be executed when this function is called. So this is why it is important to put some actual programming language in the body of these event handling functions because the event handling functions are the only functions that are called by the meter trader directly. So for example the onInit function is called whenever a program is initialized and we can easily check this if we go here and add a print statement and we just say for example onInit we can do this also in the onDInit function just go somewhere in the body of the function and write a print statement like this. So a print uh, statement can be, yeah, um, can be requested pretty much by the program using this print function. And the print function is a really simple function. You just call the function by its name. It starts with a capital P and then print. And in the uh, round brackets, which is the parameters of a function, we just add one parameter and this is the text that we want to print. So if we compile this program and um, then after compiling, we will then have access to the program in the meter trader because the process of compiling in programming means that you take this specific text file here and you ask the computer to turn it into a executable. So this is pretty much the process of compiling. Turning the text file, this .mq5 file that we're editing right now, into a .ex5 file, which can then be used or read or interpreted by the computer. So after compiling, you can go back to your meter trader. And if you go to the navigator in your meter trader, Again, if you do not see it, click on View Navigator. Here you can go to Expert Advisors Now and here you should find the three line strike pattern if you compiled correctly. So I can now use this program and drag it on any chart. And if I click on OK, it will be attached to the chart. You can see this. If you look in the upper right corner, you should see the name of your Expert Advisor and this little head sign. So what's going on here? Um, actually nothing because the program does not do a lot, right? But if we remember correctly, we added these print statements. So where do we print this? We print this in the meter trader in the experts tab. So if you go to the toolbox of your meter trader and switch to the experts tab, you see the expert advisor and you can always see like the source It's this expert advisor. It is printing on in it. And this is exactly because we told the program to print on init in the on init function. And this is why I say these event handling functions, they are so important because they are called by the program, by the meter trader automatically. So if any program is initialized in this chart here, or if this expert advisor is initialized, the on init function of this specific expert advisor is called. So what happens if I remove the program from the chart? You might already guess what's happening, right? Because it will print on D in it because it is written in the on D in it function. So it really is this simple. We have this on in it and this on D in it event handling function. And the on in it function is called whenever the program is initialized. On D in it is called when it is deinitialized. So let's do this again. Let me attach it to the chart. It prints on in it. Let me change the time frame. And here what's happening is it's calling the on D in it on the old time frame and the on init on the new time frame. So you can see there are special, there are several reasons why the on init or the on D init function may be called. But in general, it's like when the program is initialized, it's, it will call the on init. If it's initialized, it will call the on D init. So you're wondering what's with the on tick function. So let's add the print on tick here. And the on tick function is the one that will really um, spam a lot in the experts tab because you can see whenever there is a tick a price movement in this specific chart it will call the on tick function for this program that is attached on the chart so you can see this on tick function will be probably the most important for us but let's get rid of these print statements for now because we want to add some actual useful code later and not just these print statements and now what we still have here, I should talk uh, one or two words about this, maybe the properties uh, at, the, at the top three lines, the properties are just a information for the programmer pretty much. So if we double click the program here or this little head in the chart, 
you will see there are some information, like for example, the version ID, it's 1.00, the, copy, the copyright, the link that is below this, and all of this is coming from the three properties here. So, so you can change these values in the quotation mark and it will change the values for the EA. Just try it out and make sure to compile after changing the values. But in this tutorial, I will just delete these lines because they do not really change the functionality of the program. So speaking about functionality, what we want to do now is we want to figure out when we do have such a signal. So the first thing I want to do is make our program not process everything on a tick basis. Because this is a little bit annoying, right? It will print on tick or it will process the on tick function on every single tick. But essentially since these chart patterns, they only appear after one bar closes. Like for example, in this specific example, we have three bars going up, one huge bar going down, and then at the beginning of the next bar, the fifth bar, so to say, we want to check the previous four bars. So what we want to do in our program, we want to check if there is a new bar, new bar in the chart. So you can see what I just did here. I just wrote a comment. And I can write comments like this. Just add these two slashes at the beginning of a line and it will make the whole line a single line comment. Which means I can do, I can write whatever I want here, blah, 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 blah. And if I compile, there's no error or something because it is a comment. If I wrote, would write this here in a new line without a comment, we get a problem, of course, because this is not proper code. So it has to be a comment if I want to write a information to the programmer or to myself. So how can we check if there's a new bar? Like the easiest way is to just figure out if the total amount of bars in this specific chart increases. So what we want to do is first of all, we want to declare a so-called global variable. And global variables are declared on a global scale. What does this mean? They are not declared inside of a function. The variables inside of a function are always local variables because they only live inside of this function. Okay, I know this sounds kind of complex, but it's not. Let's just start by declaring this global variable and I will explain the local variable thing in, again in a second. So what we want to do here is we want to declare a new variable. So by if we declare a variable, it pretty much means we, we are telling our computer that we want it to reserve a spot in the memory for a specific value. And the computer needs to know how big this spot in the random access memory has to be. So the computer needs to know what specific kind of variable we want to store because different variable types take up a different amount of space in the random access memory or in the memory of your PC. So by giving the type of this value, first we can make sure that the computer knows how much space to reserve in the, in the, in the random access memory, right? And in this case we want a int, which is the short form for integer value. And integer values are values like this, so any values that are numbers, but they do not have a decimal point. And we want to store the total amount of bars in our chart in this specific variable or, in other words, at this specific spot in the memory of our PC. And the total amount of bars in a chart is just a number without a decimal point. So we, we are using the integer data type. Second thing that is requested is a name. And we will just say something like bars total. but this name could be anything. You could say um, bus total, it is. You could say my dog is named Bello. So anything works. So if I compile this, you can see no errors, no problem. Also make sure to add this semicolon at the end of the line so the computer knows that this statement is finished. So you can see this name is uh, super confusing. So what I would suggest is just choose a name for your variable that makes sense. So in this case, we will go with bars total. And also uh, see what I did here. I use the camel case, 
writing style. So we start the first word, so to say, with a small letter, and then every following word, we start with a capital letter. Bars total are in this variable. So something like this. So small letter, capital letter, capital letter, capital letter. So you can see this makes it easy to read. And this is the style that I use for my normal variables, and that's the style that pretty much most programmers use. So it makes you, uh, sense that you also do it in this chemical case writing style. So what we did here is like with these three things, we declared a variable. First, the variable data type, then the variable name, then the semicolon, so the computer knows this statement is finished. If we compile this, we're good. No error, no problem, happy program, happy programmer. What we want to do now is in the onInit function, what we can do here is we can say bars total is equal to, and what we could do here is right now we could count the amount of bars in this chart. Um, but it doesn't make sense because there are a lot of uh, bars in the chart and we would probably have to count to like a really huge number. So what we do is in programming, we usually try to find the easiest way to do something. And in this case, we will add a value to this variable, but we do not do it like this, by just saying bus total is equal to some value. Instead, we want to say bus total is equal to the return value of a function. The function will be i bars. And you can see this function is like i bars is the function name, and we can always call functions by their names, just as we did with the print function before. And then in the brackets, just like with the print function before, we have the parameters. And the parameters can be only one value. Sometimes there's also no parameter at all for functions, or there could be multiple. But as you can see here, if we use some predefined or system functions, whatever you want to call them, like the ibars function, if you write the opening round bracket after the function name, you will immediately see the name or the yeah the names pretty much of these parameters so you already know what is requested and in this case it is a string type variable which is the symbol name so what this means is pretty much the the symbol is requested and the symbol is euro US dollar in this case so we could write something like this also note that i use these quotation marks Whenever we have text values in pretty much any programming language and also in MQL5, we wrap these text values in quotation marks. This is a way to show the computer, and this is also necessary and requested, to show the computer that it is a text value inside of these quotation marks. And you might wonder why it is a text value um, that we add here, because the first parameter, and you can see it here in the preview or the um, function signature, there's a string value requested and string values are text values. So string values are always text values. So usually they should be wrapped or they should be wrapped in quotation marks and they can be pretty much any text value in quotation marks. And for example, the symbol name is a text value. So we could do something like this, like adding euros dollar. This is a working way. In a second, I will show you a better way. But let's first have a look at the second parameter. And the second parameter, if we have a signature again, have a look at the signature again, it's the time frame. Because you might um, realize already, if we change the time frame, the amount of bars in these time, frame, time frames could be different. It depends on the amount of data that you have for your symbol. But it is important to get the time frame uh, or to give the time frame as a information for the ibars function so the function will know what specific chart you want to get the bars for right but if we add this comma here and if you have multiple parameters for a function they are always separated with a comma you can see the possible options for the second parameter the time frame are already suggested so it's it usually starts with period for chart period and then underscore and then you can choose whatever period you like. So for example, I could say period H4 since I'm using this right now. 
And these are the two parameters. So once I added all of these or both of these two parameters, I will just end the list of parameters and I will end the whole line with a semicolon. So if I compile this, it works. And this is called the initialization or initialize the bus total variable. Because it's the first time that we put a value inside of this bus total variable. So this is the declaration, declare the bus total variable. And then here we initialize it in the on init. And yeah, so we use this function. And if you move your cursor inside of this ibars function, and if you go to help MQL5 reference, it will open the MQL5 reference and it will automatically show the entry for the ibars function. So the MQL5 reference is great. It's like the, the only one textbook that you, that you need to understand MQL5 programming because you will find every system function in here. So you can have a look here if you scroll down. You will find like everything you need to know about the, uh, the programming language. You can read about any function, any enumeration, any, any, anything. So for example, for this ibars function, we see exactly what the function does, how it looks like, the signature, what the parameters mean, and what the return value is. So we talked about the parameters, I explained what the function does. Let's talk about the return value. Functions can return a value. They do not have to, but they can return a value. And it means that if you call the function, and if the function is processed later on during runtime of your program, it will process some inputs, put parameters, for example, like the parameters, and then it will give back exactly one value or no value. But in this case, it will give back one value. And the return value is the number of bars in a specific chart. And this is perfect because it's exactly what we want. So this is why we can turn, uh, we can return the return, like the, the total amount of bars when we call this ibars function. And since we are storing this value in the bus total uh, variable, we will then have the total amount of bars stored in this bus total variable. So what we can do is we can say print bus total and let's also add another parameter. We can say something like this and you will see what this is doing in a second. So I can say print bus total and then I say before. So you see we print the bus total value two times one time before we update the bus total variable and one time after we did this. So if I compile this, you will see it's zero before, it's uh, 46,305 afterwards. So you can see our function call is indeed working. And if we would go ahead and count the amount of bars in this chart, I mean, it would be pretty dumb to do this, right? But it would be 46,000 something. So you can see this function is working and now we have the value stored in our bus total variable. And you will see in a second why we are doing all of this. We are not doing this for fun. So let me get rid of the print statements again. And also I promised you a better way of like saying what specific symbol we want to use because you see it works like this. We can use Euros dollar, but this only kind of works if we are applying the program to the Euros dollar chart. But if we would use it in the USD Japanese yen char uh, chart, it wouldn't really make sense to like hard code the Euros dollar. It would make sense to do something like this. Instead of Euros dollar, write underscore symbol. Because this underscore symbol, it is a system variable. And if we have a look at the reference again, oh yeah, by the way, you can just go your, with your cursor inside of the word and then press F1 on your keyboard or again go to help. MQL5 reference. So it will open the entry here and you can see this symbol variable is of type string. So it matches the re requested um, data type and it will contain the symbol name of the current chart. So underscore symbol in this case would be equal to Euros dollar. But in the USD Japanese yen chart, it would be equal to USD Japanese yen. So yeah, this is how we can do this. So now we are doing all of this to figure out if there's a new bar in the chart, right? So this is what we want to do in the onTick function. So we have the comment already. And what we want to do now is we want to get another variable here. And this is uh, what we call bars. And it will also get the value of the ibars function and the period h4, for example, as a uh, time frame. 
Also, another trick that I want to show you right away, instead of like hard coding this period H4, which is also not a very good idea, because maybe you want to use the H1 chart later, or maybe you want the user of the program to decide what time frame he wants to use. In this case, it is a good idea to create a so-called input variable. So just go ahead at the very top of your program, write input, so the PC knows it's an input variable, and then write enum timeframes. And we write enum timeframes because if you have a look at the IBAS function again, this is the data type pretty much that is requested here. And the enum timeframes is a little bit a specific data type because you will find it here. There's a link to this time frame, uh, to this enumeration. And if you click it, you will find the enumeration. And this is a so-called enumeration. So the 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 possible options pretty much are predefined. So you can choose any of these values. So for the programmer, it's pretty easy to work with these values because you have all of the time frames. But under the hood, like for the PC, a, all of these enumeration IDs pretty much just translate to an integer value. But this is like some background knowledge that is not like super important. So just that you know, like whenever you see these enumerations, they usually start with enum, like under the hood, it's usually just a integer value. But the enumeration makes it easier to work with as a programmer. So here we can create this variable of type enum timeframes and we have to choose a name. So we will of course not go with Bob because again, that's dumb. We will go with timeframe. So the name of the variable already explains what the variable holds. And then we choose a default value. So you can see we are doing the initialization and the initialization in the same line. This also works. And we will go with period, at period H4, for example. So we are pretty much doing the same thing, right? Do not forget the semicolon, though. But now we can, instead of hard coding time frame uh, period H4 here, we can say we want to use the time frame variable. So whatever value is inside of this time frame variable. So we do this here and here, and you might have some questions. For example, what is this? And the answer is this is an input variable. So it's a global variable. We can use it everywhere in the program. And usually when I declare input variables, I make them start with a capital letter also. From this point on, I would go with camel case, time frame to use, something like this. But I will also make the first letter a capital letter. So this is my way of uh, declaring input variables. And then since we wrote this input at the beginning of it, if we go back to the meter trailer 5 and double click the little head here, you can see we now have the inputs tab here. And the user is able to change this. And if the user chooses to, to change the time frame in the inputs, from this point on, Whenever the time frame variable is used in the program, it will use the value that the user chose. So this is the power of input variables. It just, it just gives your user or the user of the program, in most cases it's yourself pretty much, but you can just change specific parameters of the program easily without having to change the code. So, okay, so what's going on in the onTick function? We created this new variable, we declared it, we already initialized it. You might ask yourself, why? <laughs> because we already have this bus total variable. But there's a big difference. This bus variable, it is a so-called local variable. It's local because we declared it in the body of the onTick function. So it just lives locally in the onTick function. If we try to say in the onDenian function bus is equal to 3, we will get an error. Because bus is not known in the onDenian function. But if I try to change the bus total variable to 3 in the onDenit, no error. And this is because the bus total variable is what I said before, it's a global variable. It was declared on a global scale, on the like most basic scale of, um, or scope, scope is the right word, on the most basic scope of the program. So if we declare it on a, on a global scope like this, we can use it in any function, but if we declare it as a local variable, like we did here with the bus function, it only lives in the scope where we declared it. So this one only lives in the onTick function. And when the onTick function is processed completely, the bus function will be erased from the memory of your PC immediately 
This is different for the bus total variable because it's on a global scale, so it will live throughout the whole runtime of your program. And this is why we need different scopes to achieve some stuff in some cases. So what we want to do here uh, as a next step is we want to check if the bus total variable holds a different value than the bus variable. And this can happen because the bus total variable is only initialized in the onTick function and then the value never changes. But the bus variable, it will also always get a new value or will always be created new and will get the value of the current amount of bars in this chart with every single tick. So at some point, the value in the bus variable will be bigger than the value in the bus total variable. And we can check if these values are unequal by using a if statement. If statements are usually built like this, or always. You have this code word if, I, F, pretty simple. And then in round brackets, you have a condition. So it's always if, and then in round brackets, you have condition. And then in curly brackets, you have the body of this if statement. It always looks like this. So what's going on is we have if, so the computer means it's an if statement. Then we have a condition where you usually compare different values. And here we compare these two values using this exclamation mark uh, equal, which means for the PC that he has to check if these values are unequal. There are different of these logical operators. For example, um, like this means unequal. Um, this means equal, then we have a smaller than, we have a greater than, we have a smaller or equal, and we have a uh, greater or equal. I think these are the most important ones. I think these are all of them. But yeah, you have a lot of these. Uh, no, these are com comparison operators, I think. Um, sometimes I don't really get the technical terms correctly because I'm also a self-taught programmer. So, but yeah, I always try to just explain what it means. So you can, you can read it here. Like these are the operators that you can use to compare different values. Like check if they're unequal, if they're equal, if they're smaller, greater, smaller or greater uh, or equal. So you can see where this is going. So you can use these uh, operators to build conditions. Uh, also, if you would combine multiple conditions, like you could say, I want to check this condition and a second condition, condition two, for example. You also have more operators like and, and, and you also have like or, like this. So these are all operators that you can use to build conditions for if statements, for example. So I could, for example, also check two conditions. Or I could check if only one condition is true of both of these. Yeah, but long story short, whenever the condition of a if statement is true, like if this is true, indeed, we enter the body of the if statement. So only if this is true, the PC will process whatever is in the body of this if statement. And here we want to say bars total should be updated to the value of bars, which means that with the next tick, these values will be the same. So this is a way of... Um, uh, yeah, just um, checking if there's a new bar in the chart. So if I compile this and we can, for example, now say, um, let's add a print statement here. So we can say bus total or let's say bus total was and then we print bus total and is now and then we print bus. Something like this. This will give us a, a idea of what's going on. So if I compile this, and, oh wait, I need to get the comma here. So if I compile this, and if we now go back to our program, let's switch to the one minute time frame. Let's go to the settings. Let's switch to the one minute time frame here and click on OK. So if there is now a new bar in the chart in the next few seconds, it will print this in the, uh, in the experts journal. So yeah, here you, you can see, see there was just this new bar. So before this bar, there was, there were, 100,000 bars and now it's 100,002. Uh, I mean, it was 100,001 before, now it's 100,002. And um, it's now, it's 
now. Yeah, but you can see we're figuring out like when a new bar appears. So we are only processing the code in this if statement now once per bar. And this is super important because we also, we, we only want to do this once per bar. So if you have a look at this original video again, now we can check like at the beginning of this new bar, we can check the previous four bars. And this is actually done very, very easily in the meter trader programming. So what we want to do is we want to have a look at the opening and the closing price of the last bars, right? So first of all, we want to check the very last bar. If it's a, uh, a long or a, like a green or a red bar, right? So what we want to do is we want to check if, mm, so we want to get the, the open and the close of the last bar. So we say open one is equal to I open and then symbol time frame one. I will explain this in a second, but let me create um, the, the close variable first. Close symbol time frame one. So what's going on here? We are declaring two new variables and we initialize them right away. So we declare double variables. What are double variables? Double variables are numbers again, but with a decimal point like this. So these are double values. They are different compared to the integer values because integer values like this, they do not have the decimal points, but double values, values have the decimal point. And this is important because we want to store price data. And price data, as you can see here, usually has like a decimal point. So what kind of price data are we storing in these variables? Like open one and close one is just the name that I chose for these variables. And you can see you can also have numbers in variable names. It's, it's not a problem. But I think they cannot really start with a number. Yeah, this will not work. But if you have numbers like not as the first letter of a variable name, it will work. So we are storing the return value of these two functions. And the functions are pretty simple. They pretty much do what the name says. They will give you the open price of a specific bar. So let's have a look at the reference. And again, press F1 on your keyboard to open it. And it will, it will return a double value, which is great because we want to store it in a double variable. And also it, um, it requests three parameters. The program needs to know what symbol we want to get the price for, what time frame, and what shift value. So what specific bar. So we talked about symbol before, we talked about time frame before, so this is pretty obvious. We are using the underscore symbol and the time frame variable from the inputs here again. And then the last parameter is the shift value. And I will have to explain this. So since there are many, many bars in one chart, the program needs to know what bar we want to get the value for. So the shift value, it always starts at the very last bar. The current bar will have the shift value zero. So always the currently last bar in the chart has the shift value zero. And the previous bar has the shift value one. And then it goes on like this, like this would be two, three, four, five, six. So you can see counting starts with zero at the current bar and then it just increases um, the further you go to the left side. So by saying one, we are getting the open and close price for the last bar. So let's get this print statement and let's move it here maybe. Bars total, blah, 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 and is no blah, blah, blah. And now we can also, for example, have another print statement, open one is, and let's just print this. Let's just say we want to print like the open one value and the close one. Close one, like this. So if I compile this, we should be good. Also, we could add a comment here, uh, get the open and close price of the last bar. And now if we go to our program, if there's a new bar, we will see the new text messages that are printed and it will also give us the information about the open and the close price of the last bar in this chart. So to compare this later on, the easiest way to do so is click on view data window because then if you use the crosshair, if you press control and F on your keyboard, you can get the uh, open and the close price here in the data window. So once there is a new bar, we will just check this quickly and compare it to the values in the experts um, journal here. So for this specific bar, which is the last bar, we see that the open and close price um, printed in the expert journal are exactly the same as in the data window. So you can see now we figured out if the last bar is or the, the open and close price of the last bar. 
and now we can check if last bar is green or red. So what we can do is like it's super easy. We use another if statement to check a condition. We use our operators here and what we want to do is we want to compare these two values, right? So we want to say if open is smaller than close. Yeah, it's of course a, a green bar. Green bar. And if open is greater than close is a red bar. So this is pretty easy, I think, and pretty self-explaining. So if we compile this, we now figured out if the last bar is green or red. And what we want to do next is um, we want to check if, or let's also get the, the, the open and the close of the previous three bars. So um, let's just get it for the last bars. And then we can also say like open two, and we're just getting like the different prices for all of these different um, indices in the chart. Like we just get the open and close price for the last four bars. And we, we, we always just do it like this. And I could also copy this, of course. So we do it for the last uh, four bars. We get the open and the close price. If you copy it, make sure that you do not um, forget to make the changes here. You always change the shift value and the name of the variable. Otherwise, you will get problems. So if we did it like this, we can now check if we have a, um, a green bar, we can check if the previous three bars were red. So we check if open uh, two is greater than close two. And here, now we want to make use of this end that I explained before. So we can combine multiple conditions. We can check if open two is greater than close two, and we check if open three is greater than close three, and we check if open four is greater than close four. Like this. So you can see this is pretty easy. So we're checking, um, check if, uh, oh yeah, if last bar is green or red, and then here we check if previous bars uh, were red, like this. And we can also say here, like, check if the last bar is green. Um, so like this, and then we also here check if the last bar is red. These are just comments uh, that I'm writing right now. And then let me copy these lines, paste it here for the... Um, for the other signal, and then we are checking if the previous bars were green, right? So to check this, we just have to exchange these comparison operators. Um, and now we can add a print statement here. Like for example, um, this would be a, if the last bar is green, it would be a buy signal, right? Something like this. And here we would have a sell signal, right? So sell signal. And now we want to use the strategy tester to, st to test our strategy. And let's get rid of these print statements for the moment because they can be really annoying later on. And they will just spam a lot in the expert journal. But if you do it like this and compile, you should not see any errors. If you see any errors at this point, the most common mistakes are that people try to forget a bracket, they try to place a semicolon, they mess up the structure and the easiest way to not mess up your structure is to always use the tabulator button on the keyboard to move code to the right if it is a smaller scope. So you can see like in this onTick function everything on the most basic level in the body of the onTick function is moved three spaces to the right or one press of the tabulator button on your keyboard. And then if I go to an even smaller scope, like for example in the if statement, I move everything in this if statement further to the right by three spaces or one press of the tabulator button. And as when the scope gets smaller and smaller by using more if statements, again, I apply the same mechanism again and again. I move everything to the right. So it's really easy to read. So you can see this closing bracket here, it will close this if statement. And this closing bracket will close this if statement. And this if statement is closed here. And this on tick function is closed here. So this is the easiest way of like not messing up your code. 
But yeah, if we compile it like this, we can go back to the meter trader. And now we could wait for a signal, but it could take a while. So let's now go to view instead and open the strategy tester. Also, we can close the toolbox so it's not in the way. So when the strategy test is loaded here, I will also go to view again and close the toolbox. So there's the strategy tester. So let me click on view toolbox to close the toolbox. And now in the strategy tester, I want you to click on visualize. So click on the overview here for the strategy tester, click on visualize. And then you can pretty much just choose any expert you want to test. In this case, we will use the three line strike pattern, of course. You can choose any symbol. Let's go with Euro Dollar since we use this until now. And you could choose any time frame and any custom period. So let me just test the, the current year 2024 when I'm recording this. And you can choose any time frame, of course. And um, make sure to tick the visual mode. This is important if it's not ticked. In the inputs, we want to use the same time frame, of course, so one hour. You could also just choose period current here or the current um, time frame, and it will automatically use the one that you selected here. If you did all of this in the upper or lower right corner, you want to click on start, and this will uh, simulate this specific program on historical data for the period that you selected. Um, you, of course, need to have the data in your meter trader. But yeah, now we have the data and now we can wait until there is uh, a signal. So let's see um, when we have three uh, candles into one direction like and then uh, one uh, candle in the opposite direction. And we, s I think we saw it, we, we, we just saw it. So if we go to the toolbox here and go to the journal, yeah, there is a buy signal. So you can see um, this is hopefully the right time. Yes, it is the right time. So you can see we had one, like one, two, three red bars and then we had this green bar and this is um, the buy signal. So then we get the buy signal printed here. So let me speed up. Let's search for, for, for some more signals. So here somewhere we saw a sell signal. It was probably here at 19 o'clock. Yes, it was. So you can see here, we also see this sell signal. And yeah, you can just check it out on your own PC. You will find these signals. So now you, we, like we could make any adjustment we like to this program. For example, we could say we only want to see the signal like it is shown in the video here if the big bar, like the in this example, the red bar is bigger than all of the three bars before. So what we can do here, it's, it's actually very easily done. Maybe we can just um, add another if statement. And you can do whatever you want. But in this case, I want to say like, for example, if, and then we take um, the, wait, this is a, a green bar, so we want to check if the open one is um, open one. No, I think we just let's just check if the close one is greater than the open four. This should make sure check if last bar is really big. <laughs> This is like an easy way to check if, if the last bar is very big and you will see what this changes in second in the chart. Uh, if close one is smaller than open four, and we will of course also do this for the sell signals. So here we also say, um, wanna check if the last bar is very big. Check if uh, last bar is really big. So like this. So if we compile now and let's just quickly do the same test. So let me close the last test and let me start another test right away. And now we should see a lot less signals because now we are only getting the signals if the last bar is like, like really huge. So let me, let me fast forward so we can see some actual, some actual signals. Oh, there was a sell signal already. So let's check if this is a correct signal. And we saw the signal at the 3rd of January. Uh, eight o'clock yeah here so yeah right now you can see we are checking if the close of this red bar here wait let me try to zoom in here um third eight o'clock so we're checking of of if the the close of this red bar like where my cursor is right now if it is close a small like below the open of 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 this bar here and it is in fact true, like just by a small amount, but it is true. So 
So you can check, see like this is a way of like just adding more conditions to your program to filter out a lot of these signals. And you can see we're getting a lot less buy and sell signal now. So you can see, uh, for example, let's check, check one more signals, uh, like 20 second at um, 19 o'clock. So yeah, this was another signal. And you can see three bars were going down, one bar was going up, so we kind of enter a trade, or we will enter a trade in a second. So you can see you can easily change your conditions once you build the base, base for your program. And I will not like do everything here now. This is something you can do on your own, just get like the open and close prices of the last bars and play around with these if statements. And you can add and combine as many conditions as, as you like, just applying the same routine that we did here. But now, instead of doing more of this, I want to show you how to actually open positions. And the easiest way in MetaTrader 5 program is to use, use the trade.mqh file. Just do it like this. I will not explain this in detail because it would go a little bit too far in this uh, really basic uh, programming tutorial, but just write this hashtag include and then smaller than a trade slash trade dot mqh greater than and this will include another file. This goes a little bit into the topic of object oriented programming. If this is something that sounds interesting to you and if you want to learn more about MQA5 programming and even some more advanced stuff that will really help you to write super efficient and super beautiful programs that can do anything, make sure to check out the link in the video description below this video because I already put together a complete course where I explain so much, much, much more stuff and so much more in depth than I do here on YouTube. And yeah, you will learn everything you need to know about MetaTrader 5 programming. And I have many, many students that message me that they were able to like write their own strategies after taking the class. So if you're interested, definitely check it out. But in this video, we will just use this class here now to open the positions. So what you can do is, for example, create a object variable of type C trade and it's done like this. You write C trade and then the name of this variable. So in the end, it's just the declaration, like declare a, a variable. But in this case, it's a object variable, which is again, a little bit more complex. It's about object oriented programming. But for you right now, you just need to know it is of type C trade and it will give us all the power that this specific class has. And the C trade class was designed to open, manage and close positions and like place and delete orders um, efficiently. So what we can do is when you did this, and when you like compile and do not get any errors, you can go down here again, where it says by signal. And now you can say trade, or let's uh, write a comment, or we can write a comment later on, write trade and then buy trade dot buy like this. And then in the round brackets, you can see all of the parameters that are possible. But in this case, let's just go with the first parameter for now, which is the volume. And here we are opening a position or sending the order. So this will send a order for a buy market position with 0.1 lots. Also, we can do this here. To, sell the sell, uh, to send the sell order. Sending the order and instead of buy, we just say sell with a capital letter. And since maybe the user wants to change the lot size, it's always a good idea to create a input variable for this. So instead of hard coding 0.1, let's say lots. If I compile this, there's an error, of course, because this variable does not exist, but we can change this in a second at the very top of your program. Just write input double lots and then write something like 0.1 as a default value or whatever you want to choose. If we compile this, we should now see that um, if you go back to the program, start the program again, we should now see that it will not only figure out where these patterns are, but it will automatically send the order. And that's the whole beauty and the power of automation when it comes to trading. You don't have to sit in front of the PC, the program will just scan the market like at any time of the day, even when you're sleeping, and it will trade automatically. So you can see here, order is placed after the signal appears. Boom, as easy as this. And yeah, it's a short order, going good so far. And we will also see like if there are more signals, we see more orders. 
And these orders are open, but of course never closed because we do not really have ATP or ASL. And this is something we could change here quickly now. So let's go back to our program. And let's make sure that we get the TP and SL up and running. So you can see all of these parameters of the buy and sell function. Um, they, they, for example, like you, you can say what symbol you want to open this order for. And we will go with underscore symbol, of course, for both of these trading operations. And the next one is the requested price. So we have to say at what specific price do we send this order. Usually when you open market positions, it's, it's thus just the current ask and bid price. For example, for buy positions, you want to open at the ask price. So let's declare a new variable for this and let's use the symbol info double function to get the symbol underscore ask price for the current uh, for the symbol that is given here as the first parameter. And symbol ask is just part of a enumeration. You can read about it in the reference, of course. And the symbol info double function is a function that will give uh, you the like any information or any property of a specific symbol. So we can use this to get the ask price. So we will add this as the price parameter. And then the stop loss and TP are requested. So we also want to calculate this. So let's say uh, stop loss will be equal to ask. Oh, no, 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 this was wrong. The stop loss will be calculated in a different way here. We say the stop loss is the um, is at the lowest point of all of these values, pretty much. So what we want to do is we can say, um, there are different ways of doing this. Like we could say we just want to get the lowest price, like using math minimum, and then comparing all of these values, like uh, open one, open two, or yeah. Like you could combine the math minimum function. It will always compare two values, and we get the 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 the, the most like the smallest value. But in this case, a better solution would be to get the lowest price of the last x bars anyways. So what we want to do is we want to get the index for the lowest low and we can do this by using the i lowest function for the current symbol for the time frame and then we want to say mode low because we want to get the lowest price and then we want to say for the last four bars starting at the last bar like this. So you can see if you have a look at the re um, reference, the i lowest will give us the index or in other words the shift value of the smallest value out of the time series that we um, declare here. And the time series that we declare is mode low, which means that we are pretty much just checking the lowest prices of the last four bars. And we will get the index of whatever bar has the lowest low. And this is then the index that we want to use for the i low function. So the i low function is a function similar to the i open and i close. We just give the symbol, the time frame, and then the index that we want to get. And here we want to get the index lowest low, of course. And if we compile it like this, we can now use the sl here. And now we just have to, um, yeah calculate the TP and in this case let's just say the TP will be a multiple of the stop loss points so we can just say something like ask plus and then we say ask minus SL multiplied with um, a specific factor like 2 for example. So this is just a mathematical operation to add a multiple of the stop loss distance to the current ask price and this will give us the price of the TP. So, get entry price is just the ask price. Then here, get lowest low of the last four bars. Um, get low of the lowest low <laughs> of the last four bars, pretty much. And here we calculate the TP. Calculate TP as a multiple of the stop loss distance, like this. 
and this should be this should be enough so let's just copy all of these lines copy and let's just uh, paste them here before we send the, 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 the cell order, right? So here we want to do the same pretty much, but instead of uh, working with the bid price, we want to work with the, uh, sorry, instead of working with the ask price, we want to work with the bid price. Then we want to get the highest high, highest high of the last four bars. So we, of course, rename this variable to index highest high. We want to say I highest instead of I lowest just another function. We want to use mode high instead of mode low. We get the high of the highest high of the last four bars. Instead of I low, we use I high. We use index highest high. And we calculate the TP as a multiple of the SL. But of course, the calculation is a little bit different for the cell positions. We should do it like this. But then if we add <coughs> these variables here, like bit, um, SL, and TP, and if we compile, you should not see any errors at this point. And if you start the program again, now we should see that this is a fully working program and it will trade these reversal patterns automatically for us. And let's fast forward to see uh, if we have an actual position, if it has a stop loss. I think it had a stop loss and it was actually uh, just stopped out here. And yeah, you can see like, um, wait, let me zoom in again. If I zoom in here, we can see like this uh, actual position. It was opened here after the signal appeared and the stop loss was at the highest point of these last four bars and was just stopped out before the market was going to the right direction. A little bit unfortunate, but that's how it is if you trade with a stop loss what you always should. Uh, let's wait for some more signals. And there's a buy signal. And uh, again, this buy signal is great because we have like at least three red bars. We have the big green bar, which is greater than these three red bars. We have the entry, we have the stop loss at the lowest point, and the TP should be a factor of two to one. And of course, you could also make this factor an input variable. Just feel free to modify and adjust the code in, every, in any way you like. And um, yeah, so, so, so any of these signals are now traded automatically. And uh, I don't know if this will work out in the long run, but it's just a way of like really testing any strategy you like in a quick and, and, and the most efficient way. And um, look, I can now fast forward this and we will see all of these trades done automatically. And I think like in this specific period, it worked out very badly or very poorly. I mean, yeah, it was not perfect, but it was just for two weeks. And now since you have the program, you can test this for as many weeks as you like. And also make sure to just modify the code if you feel like it would, you know, you know a better strategy. And you can change, for example, like easily change the TP factor here. You could also make this an input. Like instead of writing multiply with two, just write multiply with the TP factor. And then, uh, yeah, just create an input variable for this. So you can see like this is the power of um, of automating trading strategies. Like I could I could have a factor of three now or 3.33, whatever I like. Like you can see this is great. But make sure to like if you have a factor like this, um, I think it's wait, let me check if it's automatically rounded. Because uh, sometimes I think think this was especially in the MetaTrader 4 an issue that if you work with price data for position opening you need to round them, but I think in meter 5 it's done automatically. Yeah, yeah, we're good. And you can see now the TP is three times as big as the stop loss. And you can see here we just made a really big profit. So, um, yeah, small changes like this, they, they, they can really change the whole outcome of the strategy. And you can see like just by automi automization, it's so easy to, to, to test complex strategies and also easy strategies like this one over multiple, multiple years. So let me show you the code again. And then in the end, like if you copied the code and if you think this is useful, um, please give a thumbs up. Also recommend this video to your friends if you think someone else should learn about automated programming. Make sure to, ch check out the, uh, make sure to check out the, the link in the, in the video comment if you want to learn more with a like really efficient programming course. And also I definitely need your feedback on the chart comments here or the code comments. Because in this tutorial, I made a lot of code comments, 
what I usually did not do in the previous coding tutorials. So it would be great to, get, to, to, to hear your feedback on this. But let me talk you through the code again real quickly. So at the beginning, we just include this trade.mqh file. Then we have three input variables. Again, input variables are the ones that can be used anywhere in the code and that the user is able to change. Then we have two global variables. They can also be used anywhere in the code, but they cannot be changed by the user. In the onInit function, we just initialize the bus total variable because then in the onTick function, we are checking with the help of the bus variable if there was a new bar in the chart. And if yes, we're getting the open and close price for the last four bars. This is what we will then need to build the condition for this chart pattern. And when we have a buy or sell signal, we just send a order. Here we send the buy order using the trade object variable. Before this, we calculate the TP and the SL. And then if we have a sell signal here, we just um, calculate TP and SL for the sell signal. And we send this sell, um, sell order here using the C trade class or the, the object variable that we created. So that's it. Really simple program. If I would cross out all of my comments, it would be like probably 60 or 80 lines of code. And you can use this code to test this specific chart pattern super efficiently for the last, if you want, 20 years. So yeah, hope you can use this. Make sure to make all the adjustments, adjustments you like and let me know in the comments if you have any questions. That's it. Thanks for watching. Have a great time and good trades. Bye.